So I want to say good evening and welcome to our fourth season of Village Square. I want to introduce myself and Dr. Henry Mack. He's going to be speaking after. He's much more, slightly more articulate than me. And you know what? I say he should go into politics. I'm just saying. So we are the Village Square and advisory board members, and we're delighted you could join us here this evening. One of the great things about where we are right now is that we really, we had a lot of great options around Broward County. And at the end of the day, most of the options, thank God, were in my district. But this one specifically, you're sitting in the middle of what used to be the Sears Kenmore Appliance Warehouse when I was a little tyke running around Oakland Park. And this was where your washing machine came from, maybe your parents' washing machine. But now it is a world-renowned brewery that has been sold uh, for quite a lot of money. And we're having a great time, but more importantly, we're talking about some great things. So I want to say it, it's great to see so many of you who have supported us these last few years, and it's great to see so many new faces as well. For those of you who've been with us before, you'll know that this will be the one time that we'll ask you to pull out your cell phones, and if you're on social media, which doesn't matter whether you're a millennial, a high school student, or old like me, we're all on social media, we're going to ask you to post, tweet, or share the information about the Village Square. The hashtags are hashtag Village Square or, and hashtag Broward College. Or as some of my colleagues would say, number sign. <laughs> for, those, for those of you who are new to the Village Square, we provide a safe and comfortable forum for civic engagement on matters of local, state, and national importance. At the Village Square, you'll hear viewpoints from both those who favor and those who oppose an issue. It's important for those that, that, that the individuals opposing views or different political backgrounds can come together and have an elevated conversation about a topic. I know that uh, President Armstrong, who is here, still the president, uh, he and I had talked a lot about these issues. And one of the things that binds our community together, I don't care if you are the one person on my side of the aisle in the county commission or the eight other ones, we all agree that we're, we are one community, we have to move forward together. And, and of all the people in this room, I'm gonna tell you that President Armstrong is the one person that never takes a side, but always tries to figure out how we bring the two sides together to get an issue done. So, we do things at the, di the Dinner at the Village Square and Take Out Tuesday series. This event tonight is we call the Dinner, dinner at the Square. Clearly you're eating dinner. And it's the signature Village Square event. The debate will be spirited, but fact-based and civil, and dinner is included in your ticket price. If you didn't find that out right now, you're not enjoying it. Our Takeout Tuesday series are free and open to the public, and as we want to make as many people come to the Village Square as possible and make it accessible, please bring your favorite takeout dinner and drink to Broward College and join us to learn a lot about a hot local topic facing our community. I don't think it needs to be said, but I don't believe alcohol is provided uh, or accepted at Broward College, but if you can get it in there, good for you. <laughs> Hosting these events could not be possible without the leadership and vision of President David Armstrong and the support of Broward College. Our community is extremely fortunate to have both him and the college provide such thought, leadership, and direction in our community. Before we begin, a night like this could not be made, made possible without the generous support of our partners and our Village Square members so please hold your applause to the, to the end. Our partners are the Broward Education Foundation. You guys are listening phenomenally. Cult, the Council for Education Change and the Broward Principals Assistance Association. As always, an extra special thank you to our advisory board and Village Square members who are with us tonight. You'll see many of them wearing the member buttons. Those are the little red and blue buttons on the lapels. Membership is $68 and supports the mission and programming of the Village Square. The $68, I'm still not sure how we came up with that number other than the fact that I was born in 1968. <laughs> also, members get to attend a pre-dinner cocktail reception with our speakers prior to the dinner series at Square Events. And if you're interested in becoming a member, you may refer to the information in your program and sign up at the door. Also, a special thanks to our official series partner, the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance. 10 days of connection and the Broward League of Cities. Now, please help me, help me in thanking our sponsors and members and partners for their support. At this point, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Henry Mack. But most Do importantly, I want to thank... Do you think you the best start in life? 
most importantly, I, wanna, I want to tell you that I am going to, I didn't tell her yet, but I'm going to continue on to be your, if you want me, as your co-chair. But more importantly, I'm going to spend every waking moment in Tallahassee, as long as everybody here helps me get there, to making the State College of, Broward, of, of the State of Florida, and most importantly, Broward College, uh, a centerpiece of where we get our talent, we, we educate people, and we, we actually create jobs for our community. So I want to thank David Armstrong. I'm going to ask David Armstrong for a lot of help and thoughts as I go along my journey. But uh, most importantly, this is a great place to share ideas. So don't be afraid to talk to your friends. Don't fight with them. Just share your ideas. So Dr. Henry Mack. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. If there's anybody that's an embodiment of the aims of the Village Square, I would submit it's, you know, Chip Barker here for having elevated reason, dispassionate dialogue with people that uh, sometimes disagree. So thanks, Chip. And before we move forward with this evening, um, with the ground rules for the evening, we do want to acknowledge that while this dinner is focused on education, uh, it will not be addressing the tragedy that happened in Parkland, and we've decided to dedicate our June dinner uh, titled, Does Your Voice Count?, to address the power that the youth in this country have had in attempting to bring about change when an injustice or tragedy has occurred. Um, so unfolding in real time, the youth of all over the United States, led by the survivors of the Parkland shooting in particular, are calling for action, and our June dinner is addressing this movement and phenomenon. So please keep that in mind when asking your questions of our panelists this evening. And so now moving on to our program tonight for our second dinner at the Square, we delve into another heated topic, a free market for education. We wanted to make a few announcements and tell you about the ground rules, and so tonight we're talking about a topic that we might not necessarily disagree on. And so to keep this conversation civil and informative, we'd like to caution you against uh, what we call crowd or team clapping. When you clap, when your side says something you agree with, maybe even a little groan when you disagree with, or a shaking of the head, or nodding of the head, or any other <laughs> indication. Kelly Alvarez Vitali, phenomenal mother, wife, president of strategic philanthropy and all things above, will, uh, will be the, I guess, referee here and ring the bell when, uh, when some violation of sorts occurs. So, right. so a portion of this evening will indeed be dedicated to Q&A, and there is a podium and a mic in the back of the room if you would like to ask a question. So please be conscious of your time when asking questions and please stay on topic. That's especially for Ryan Ryder if he's in the audience tonight. <laughs> we want to. There he is. <laughs> we want to get in as many questions as possible. And so, lastly, I have the pleasure of welcoming our guests and panelists and moderator for this evening. So please help me in welcoming our panelists, Joy Frank, with the Florida Association of District School Superintendents. <laughs> please come right up. Bill Maddox with the James Madison Institute. <laughs> Carrie Ann Royas, an education blogger and parent. <laughs> and our moderator for this evening, um, the esteemed Superintendent Robert Runcie of Broward County. And before Hen Dr. Mack and I leave, I, wa I want to recognize one of our brand new City Commissioners, who's been right through about 10 hour meetings already. Uh, Heather Moritis, who's here, and thank you for your service to Fort Lauderdale. Thank you. Now on to our programming, and before we begin to our, our debate, we will watch a short video, and then Superintendent Runcie will, uh, will kick off, so the video. Do you think you got the best start in life? Did you end up in a school that might have resembled a zoo more than it felt like an institution of higher learning? Perhaps in the past, getting by without a lot of pieces of paper to defend your intelligence may have been harder, given that nowadays we can learn so much online and that many of the world's leading and richest entrepreneurs dropped out of university. Had they have dropped out of high school, that could have been a different matter, but many great minds have not been too keen on school. One of those minds was Albert Einstein, who famously said, education is what remains after one has forgotten what one has learned in school. So does it matter where you go? That's what we'll find out today in this episode of the Infographic Show, Private School versus Public School. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. 
First of all, we should say that by public school we mean schools that are run by the government. This could be confusing for Brits as when they say public school they are not thinking of schools run by the public sector, but selective institutions that demand private payment. Basically, private school as Americans know it is public school in the UK. It's another case of tomato tomato. We'll base this show on the US today as covering the globe's schools would be impossible and some of the things we will discuss are relevant globally. You might be surprised to know that in the USA, according to the Council for American Private Education, there are 33,619 private schools in the United States. There are around 5.1 million students enrolled in these schools. It's said that private schools are home to almost 10% of all school students in the US. The same sources state that there are 441,496 teachers working full-time in private schools. As much as 79% of these schools have a religious affiliation. The Washington Post reported in 2016 that these schools are virtually all white, with non-white students only making up around 10% of students across the country. As for public schools, according to the National Center for Educational Statistics, 50.7 million public school students will be studying in one of them from pre-kindergarten to grade 12 in fall 2017. Teaching all those kids will be 3.2 million full-time teachers, which is a ratio of 16 students for every teacher. The ratio in private school is 12 students for one teacher. One of the main differences of public school is the mixed ethnicity of students. Public schools in America are made up of 24.4 million white kids, 13.6 million Hispanic students, 8 million black students, 2.8 million Asian Pacific Islander students, 0.5 million American Indian Alaska Native students, and 1.5 million mixed race students. What about costs? Well, the government pays for public schools. In 2017 to 2018, it's projected that the budget for public schools will be $623.5 billion. This means that each student will cost an average of $12,300. Taxes will pay for this. Private schools are a different matter and they are funded by tuition fees. Tuition costs will change depending on the school. For the year 2017 to 2018, the national average for private school tuition is $9,975 per year, which is $8,918 per year for elementary schooling and $13,524 per year for high school. The state of Vermont had the highest average, with high school being $31,543 per year on average. If you are looking for cheap private schooling, head to West Virginia, where the average cost for high school is currently $5,262. We should add that a handful of private schools cost around the $50,000 a year mark. So what do you get for your money besides pretty gardens and obviously top-notch facilities at a private school and perhaps metal detectors and patrolling policemen in some wayward public schools? Well, when it comes to the syllabi, public schools have to adhere to state standards while private schools have much more flexibility. This is seen as getting a better and more diverse education. The good news for not so wealthy people is that high school graduation rates in public schools has gone up recently. It reached its highest during the Obama administration in 2015 at 83.2% of students graduating. At the same time, 95% of private school students graduate. According to the website College Admission, just about all of those private school grads will attend a university, whereas only 49% of public school graduates will enter further education at college. If you want to get into an Ivy League university, there's no reason why you can't get in after attending public school. Top Tier Admissions tells us that roughly 25% of successful applicants to those top universities came from private schools and 60 to 70% from public schools. The rest were homeschooled. Private school does work for a lot of people. The richest man in the world, Bill Gates, went to a private prep school, but then he later dropped out of Harvard. On the other hand, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg went to a public school. When researching for how private school graduates out-earn other kids in the future, most of the stories are about the UK and how private school there seems to create most of the UK's millionaires. The US playing field might be a bit more level, after all Dr. Dre didn't go to private school. It seems in the US if you actually get to university, it might not matter where you studied in high school in terms of making it. At the same time, studies have found that being born with a silver spoon usually means you'll be passing that spoon on, and poorer folks with degrees don't usually jump up a class. Your background makes all the difference. A college degree, says one report, is no great equalizer. Why is this? There are a host of possibilities, from family resources during childhood and the place where one grew up, to the colleges that low-income students attend, said their report. Then you have rich folks that dropped out of high school, such as the billionaire Tumblr founder David Karp, who dropped out of high school at 15 years old. Joining him as a high school dropout is Facebook's former product manager Mike Hudak and filmmaker Quentin Tarantino. In light of the last person, success in the arts or sport probably is not related to if you went to public or private school, but if you want social mobility then it's probably better your parents paid the cash for your education. It also seems that the filmmaker is the only one of the three to have come from a humble background. 
You may have some unique skills or be a natural autodidact, and so school doesn't matter much even if you are poor. Nonetheless, we can't ignore some statistics. The Bureau of Labor Statistics states that people without a high school diploma will earn on average $25,636 per year if in full-time employment. 8% of high school dropouts are currently unemployed. If you have a high school diploma and nothing else, the average wage is $35,256 per year with 5.4% of those people currently unemployed. If you have a bachelor's degree, you might earn an average of $59,124 per year. Only 2.8% of Americans with a bachelor's degree are unemployed, much less than the 4.4% of Americans currently out of a job. In conclusion, it's odds on that if you went to private school, then you most certainly went to university, and with some family wealth behind you, it's also pretty much a certainty you fell into one of those higher wage brackets. Then again, if you are brilliant, or spend more time reading than scrolling, then it is likely nothing will hold you back. So, what do you think? Is private school worth the extra dough, or is it all just a bunch of hooey? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called Vegans vs. Meat Eaters. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time. All right, I think I'm gonna side with the vegans. <laughs> Some interesting stats, huh? That, I think that told the whole thing. We could just kind of go home now, maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, one interesting statistic up there that uh, I guess I, I had to run up, I thought the average uh, per pupil funding in the country was around 11,300 or so. I see it's over 12,000. So I'll just give you some perspective. Uh, Florida is at $7,400. So just think about that in terms of where we are relative to the national average. And you've got states um, like Massachusetts and New York, they're like 18, 20,000. I think even Washington, D.C. is over 20,000 per student in funding. So. Um, we've got some real challenges here in Florida, not unlike many other states. Uh, you, everyone I know have seen the teacher strikes that are going on around the country. Um, we've got to do better uh, by teachers and giving us a per pupil increase uh, of our base student allocation of 47 cents um, is really unacceptable, but that's where we are. Um, so Broward will actually start the next school year would about four and a half million less to start with than we had in the prior school year. So um, it's gonna be an interesting, interesting um, year for us. Um, but with that said, uh, so we've always gotta keep uh, education uh, on as top of mind. Uh, I think this is an important topic and I think I'll throw a question in at the end. Is this actually the right question for us to be asking? Is it the right debate? Or is there another question that we need to be looking at relative to how we can improve public education for everyone, regardless of where you're going to school? Um, Florida has one of the most um, flexible um, and inviting laws for um, charter schools. In Broward County, we have almost 100 charter schools, uh, about 14% of our population. Uh, it's about 45,000 students um, in, in those schools. And so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. They're, they're not going anywhere. I mean, the interesting thing about charter schools, I'll tell everyone, is that they originated from the teachers union. So Al Shanker, who was a big union activist, uh, probably the most um, famous one. And it was interesting because although he was a big unionist, he was also a big champion of, of school reform. Um, and one of the ideas that they came up with was to create charter schools to kind of be the research and development arm, the innovation component of public schools where you could go innovate and try things that may not work in traditional schools and then figure out how to scale it back um, across the rest of the district. Um, that's not exactly what it looks like today. It's taken on a very different flavor, um, and sometimes with very different uh, mission and focus. And today, we'll talk about some of those um, developments and the evolution of what <laughs> charters look like today and what it may portend for us in, in the future. Um, so I'm <clears throat> happy to have our panelists up here. I want to thank all of you for um, joining and, and spending um, your time uh, here with us today. Uh, last thing before I get started, and I would be remiss if I um, didn't mention it, just <clears throat> want to thank um, everyone here, our entire Broward community, 
extended family for your continued um, support uh, as we go through uh, the most um, challenging time we've had in this district uh, with the tragedy that we, we've experienced on February uh, 14th. Um, so I, I know I hear from all of you on a regular basis. I, I can't thank you enough on behalf of the entire district um, and most of all our, our children, our families uh, for your continued support. Um, for those who work in the district that are here and um, continue to, to grind through and make sure that we support everyone, I thank you every day for um, your hard work. So again, thank you everyone for your continued support. Okay, so in Florida, traditional schools um, have to compete with charter schools uh, for students. How has this competition improved the overall public education system for all students in the state of Florida? Our first question up for our panelists. Will we just go down the line? We'll start with um, Joy Frank. Okie doke. Thank you. Good evening. And I want to echo I have Broward County and the uh, Parkland community and the school have been in our thoughts and prayers ever since it, it happened. And my, my, I just, y'all are on my heart all the time. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight and an honor. Uh, to be here tonight. I, first of all, the views that I express here tonight are not those of the Superintendents Association for whom I work. They are mine. They have been built um, with having 40 years, almost 40 years of involvement in and, uh, and observing the, uh, the uh, development of education policy in the state. I've been on, uh, started my professional career on legislative staff, ended up as a staff director of public schools, uh, back in the 90s and was actually involved in the uh, crafting of Blueprint 2000, an accountability um, statute that I think um, Dr. Armstrong will remember. And so I've been involved in the accountability mu movement. I also, prior to representing superintendents, when the charter school bill was first passed, there, there were originally five charter schools and I represented one of those charter schools. It's no longer in existence, so I've seen the development of charter schools from both sides. So I am speaking from the experience that I've, that I've garnered over the last almost 40 years, which is hard to believe. I think that charter schools in some ways have um, improved public schools because of the competition they have brought. But I don't think charter schools have been the only uh, venue, if you will, or choice program that have, that have spurred competition or improvement of public education. I think parents would have demanded and were demanding at the same time a variety of programs that we see in public schools that were going on simultaneously. The development and, and institution of IB programs, AP courses, dual enrollment, and other magnet programs. I re remember vividly several years ago one of my friends was putting together, it was employed by DOE, putting together a um, uh, a workshop before the State Board of Education and wanted to talk about choice programs. The only choice programs she wanted to present were those that were charter schools and other choice programs not within the public school setting. I said, wait a minute, we have tons of programs in public schools. Why don't you focus a workshop on the choice programs within the public school arena? She said, oh, okay. So I was tasked with making sure I had enough people at that state board meeting to, to showcase what's going on in public schools and we blew them away. The choice programs in public schools are unbelievable and, um, and it's our fault for not um, showcasing them enough. But I think the, um, the education that students receive now in public schools is, is enormous, is, is wonderful. I'm a passionate advocate on behalf of public education. I do think charter schools play a role. I support charter schools. And we'll go through some, uh, some questions and I'll talk about some of my criticisms about them. But I think there, is, uh, plenty of, there are plenty of choices out there. Charters are one. They have, may, have, may, have, may have helped a little bit, but I think parents would have demanded and the public school system would have responded and provided those programs anyway. So I want to express my gratitude for this opportunity and to tell you that um, this is a real special privilege for me because I serve on the board of directors at the Village Square in Tallahassee, have been in that role for, I don't know, six, seven years. So this is my first opportunity to go to another Village Square and participate in an event 
and it's kind of an un unusual position I find myself in because I'm very often in the role that um, the superintendent's playing tonight of moderator at some of our events and not a panelist, but I'm delighted to do this. I am here as a representative of the James Madison Institute, but I should also say that I'm representing my family. Um, my wife and I have four kids. We both graduated uh, from public high schools, as did all four of our kids. We both have come to a place of supporting school choice and, and uh, educational options for students, but we've arrived at that place from very different um, perspectives. Uh, one of us what found the conservative arguments for school choice very compelling. One of us found the liberal arguments for school choice very compelling. And so tonight, you'll be hearing from me both liberal and conservative arguments for school choice because I'm here to not just represent um, myself, but I'm also here in a certain sense to represent my wife's perspective as well. And let me just say on this particular question that I'm in complete agreement that competition, I believe, has helped um, bring about better results across the board in our state. And if anyone had any doubt about that, um, the recent release of the NAEP scores from two or three weeks ago should have settled that question. Um, NAEP, for those of you um, who may not be familiar, is kind of the national report card. They do a test every two years of students in every state, common test to kind of compare how students are doing in proficiency. And the state of Florida was the only state in the entire country that showed progress in all four categories of NAEP scores. And so the question then is, what is happening here in Florida? The results elsewhere were, eh, not that encouraging. Many people at the national level were kind of wringing their hands saying, why can't we get better results? We're spending more, we're doing more, we're trying harder, and we're not getting the kind of results. And lo and behold, down in Florida, eh, we're getting some positive results. Are we where we'd like to be? Of course not. We always want to push the ball further. But we have made greater progress than any other state. And I'm convinced that part of the reason for that is because parents in our state have options. If they don't find the district school that they're zoned for to be responsive to their kids' unique interests, needs, learning styles, whatnot, they can go to other schools and often take with them scholarship money or charter take advantage of a charter school or that sort of thing. And that competition then leads to not just good options outside the public school system, but it means that public schools have to do better to compete against these other um, uh, uh, schools. I, I should also say here that I think part of the reason that we see these kind of results is that when you give responsibility to parents to make choices for their kids, you not only get better schools, but I seem to think you get better parents because they're more engaged, they're more involved, they're more likely to feel that they have skin in the game and want to be sure that whatever choice they make proves to be good for their child. So the news here in Florida is better than it is anywhere else, and I'm convinced that's because we have more choice here, more charter school kids, more kids in private scholarship programs than any other state. And so those NAEP scores are not an accident. They're a reflection of some of the good things that we're doing here. All right, now let's hear from a parent who has some skin in the game. Absolutely, and I'll say also as a Broward resident that um, everything that's happened in Broward in the last few months has hit home for my kids. You know, driving to school and talking about safety codes and where do you hide in a classroom is not usual there. But my opinions are my own and it doesn't reflect that of the YWCA who is my employer. Um, and I would agree with my panelist friends and say competition is also king in the sense that iron sharpens iron. But I will disagree in saying that the parents would have made it happen anyways. And I don't think that it would have happened at a pace that it occurred. I have seen a difference and I don't know if I'm just spoiled because I have an innovator sitting to my left. But I have seen a difference from apps being able to know where my children are, being able to pay bills online, being able to speak to my child's teacher electronically. Um, customer service has improved, so it's not just the education. And I also know that there is an entirely vast array of brown and um, single parents who are very silent and who are muted and who don't feel a level of comfort 
in advocating for themselves and their children. So I don't believe that necessarily we would have seen the level of innovation happen at the pace that it did without having the level of competition that has occurred in the industry. And I'm grateful for it. I think it's made us all better. Both my children attend Broward County Public Schools, and I love that, and I love that I'm able to have a voice. But I feel that my job is really for the ones who don't live in suburbia and for the ones who don't have a voice. And so it's to help others to care about the, not more than their own kids, but someone else's kids. Well, thank you. <laughs> so it looks like a, a one big takeaway from that first round is uh, I think there's some consensus on the impact of just competition and how that has driven um, districts to get better. And I can tell you at uh, the school board level uh, that that is, impacted uh, conversations and strategy and how we compete, um, that we have to step up our game, offer uh, a better product, uh, re-examine where we are um, you know, each, each day, each month, each year. Um, so I, I think that's absolutely right. You know, as I mentioned before, there, there are lots of charter schools um, that uh, continue to uh, uh, originate uh, around the state, and Broward, as you may know, has close to 100 of them. And, you know, there, there are few constraints in terms of where charters go. They're, they're funded just um, the same way the public schools are, but there are few constraints of where they can open. And in some cases, you'll find um, a charter may open um, near an A-rated public schools that may even have some additional capacity. And there's always this conversation going is, this element of choice, I mean, it, it's great to have choice, but is it really an efficient use of um, taxpayer dollars? And then what alternative approaches would any of you offer on, on where and how we can originate um, charter schools? Is there a more strategic way for charters to be introduced um, into the community? So um, we'll start at the end again, Joy, and work our way down. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've been trying to think quite how to respond to this, this question. I think um, charter schools were established in part to provide more innovation and also to be really a niche market, if you will, to provide programs that the public schools were not able to offer because they might not have had the mass of students to provide the programs that they otherwise wanted to provide. And I think in watching the development of the charter school industry, if you will, where you started with a cap of how many charter schools each county could have based upon their population, to a few years later eliminating those caps, so you basically had a free-for-all of um, charter schools being able to open up wherever they wanted to, regardless of whether or not there was a need. There might have been a need in some people's minds, but perhaps not others to kind of where we are today. What I've seen is somewhat of a demise of the mom and pops and more of the, um, the increase of those charter schools that are um, operated by for-profit management companies. And I, I kind of lament that. I think that the mom and pops are the ones that really brought a lot of innovation into school districts. At least that's what I've observed in my experience. Also, if you, in my experience, while there are charter schools that provide some um, innovative programs, for the most part, they look like regular public schools. I don't know, uh, they have same number of days, same number of hours, same schedules, almost same calendar, so that everybody gets to take their vacations at the same time. So, you know, kind of, where's the innovation? The other thing is that charter schools were created and they were supposed to provide innovation to public schools. And there really is not a lot of that interchange. And what builds up resentment in the public school folks, I'm rambling here a little bit, I have a tendency to do that, is, is we, we can only build schools based upon um, whether or not the state tells us we have a need or we have the capacity. We can't just open anywhere we want to. So I think we need to look at more innovative ways so that we protect the taxpayer dollar a little bit more and provide really more choice to all students. Um, and 
and I think there, there are several ways we could do that, um, and, and we'll just see kind of what happens in the future. So, uh, as my first uh, answer indicated, I obviously think that we've made a lot of progress, but I do think we have more uh, room to grow, and I think in the innovation area, we clearly need to be offering a wider array of options for families, and I would go well beyond charters to include, you know, uh, private schools and, and uh, you know, dual enrollment, online education, and homeschooling, and on down the, uh, down the line and uh, hybrid uh, uh, mixtures of these different uh, options. And part of the reason why I'm a big believer in options is, I'll put on my liberal hat now, is because I believe in and recognize that kids are incredibly diverse. No two kids are the same. And a school setting that might work particularly well for one may not work particularly well for another. And I frankly think it's really unfair and wildly unrealistic to expect every district school to be able to serve well every single student that is zoned for that school. I don't think that's fair to the public schools, to the teachers, to the principals, and I think what we need is for parents to be able to say, I'd like for my child, because of this bent or that interest or whatever it might be, to be able to choose a different option and yeah, that option may exist right across the street from an A school, because guess what? Even Harvard has students that transfer out. Why? Because Harvard isn't the right place, even though it's quote unquote a good school, it's not the right place for everyone. And so even though a district school may have an A grade and deserve that A grade, it doesn't mean it's the right school for everyone. And so I want to be able to see kids get the schooling that they need because in the parents' mind, in a certain sense, nothing else matters. I mean, we surely all individually or collectively want something that's good for our entire community. But we're parents. We want what our kids need more than anything. And if that's something other than the district public school, let's give them the opportunity to take advantage of that. All right, the, the power of the parent. Carrie? So you're right, we don't care. <laughs> we want what's best for our kids. And each of our kids are different. I have a 13-year-old who could really care what's going on in the rest of the world and an eight-year-old who wants to impress you every minute of the day. But I thought about this, so, so I run a nonprofit and I was looking at this response and I was thinking, you know, options are, they really are just freedom and not having options and feeling like you don't have options and not knowing your options, it's, it's prison. And I think when you look at even the gamut of funding, and I, and I liken this to funding, you have certain institutions that fund nonprofits or fund other institutions, federal government, Children's Services Council and so forth, they have a capacity to do a lot. But that's a heavy lift, right? When you get funding from those folks. Then you have your foundations, and you have your donors, and you have people who are nimble, and they're able to fill the gaps, and they're able to help you to innovate, and to pivot, and to, and to do things in ways that the big, heavy funding can't let you do. And I feel that our public schools take on the role of that big, heavy funder to heavy lift our community and look at big system-wide issues. But then we need the folks in the middle who are going to be nimble, who are going to help us to pivot and to try things that we don't have to you know, file 500 documents to do, um, and to allow us to respond, and to respond quickly. But I do think there needs to be a difference just in that same space. You know, If public schools are doing what they're supposed to do in a particular space, then let's fill the gaps. If we're gonna bring in a charter school there, then offer something that feeds a different student, mm -hmm. that feeds a different need. And let's look at it collectively, um, because my kids are like your kids, and they're just like the kids in 33311. Mm. Uh, absolutely, and one thing I will say about public schools, we, we may be the only institution that we don't have the luxury of picking our students. We gotta take everyone, regardless of what level of challenge or promise they come to the door with, uh, we have to 
take them, we have to educate them, and we gotta educate them where they are. They could be sitting in a traditional school, charter school, they could be in one of the juvenile detention centers. We are required by law to educate them. And we saw on one of the uh, informative um, slides that we, we had earlier that private schools have significantly higher outcomes, um, especially with uh, graduation rates. It was near 100% going to college. I believe that was what we saw. Um, do you believe that this is due to the fact that they have fewer requirements, less mandates, greater flexibility, and resources? And should that same level of flexibility and resources be provided um, to our uh, public schools, traditional and charter? And do you think that would make a difference and get us closer to that level of performance? Carrie, maybe I'll start on this end with you. The answer is yes and yes. I do believe that um, the flexibility that's allowed and also the resources, frankly, there's so, many, there's so many layers to that question. The kids who have access to that level of resource, their parents, there's a legacy and generational wealth and there is seeing your parents be a part of a career path that you, you know, that, that's all generational. I think that it's unfair to say, can a public school, should a public school have the same access to that level of flexibility? You, you can't because of the numbers that you have to serve and the level of responsibility that you have for a mass amount of students. But should you be allowed to create schools within schools? I think so. Should you be allowed to create windows or spaces or places in different communities where you can create something that looks like that with a level of flexibility or some of those passes that private schools get. I think if we're fairly going to say, can public schools do it, we need to allow that level playing field in some capacity in different spaces. But I don't think it's, um, it's possible on a broad scale. All right. So when, whenever I am um, asked to consider private schools, especially here in Florida, um, Mary McLeod Bethune comes to mind, um, the great African-American educator who started the school in Daytona Beach. And it was a private, faith-based school, didn't have any of the kinds of regulations and other things that um, are common with public schools. But it was not unaccountable. Um, indeed, Bethune was accountable both to the parents who sent their kids there to convince them that yes, this was a good use of their kids' time, and that they had made a wise choice in uh, placing their kids there. And she was also accountable to the donors who contributed to her school to make it possible for her to run that. And I think that's actually a pretty good model for us today, that when we come to education, we need to be thinking in terms primarily of parents and are they satisfied with what is taking place in the classroom. And obviously tests can often help to, to show parents that kids are making progress and that they are on the path to becoming uh, college ready or whatever it might be. Um, but I don't know that we give as much attention as we ought to how parents feel about options. And I think at times we give too much attention to um, other measures of performance that may not be as relevant to students and parents um, as we think. And so I'm very much a believer in greater flexibility. And I'm also a believer in having varying ways of measuring success rather than requiring all schools to take the same test, for example. One of the reasons why there isn't greater innovation, I suspect, in charter schools is because those schools have to take the same test that the district public schools have to take. And if you want to kind of show that your school is succeeding, Ultimately, how your students fare on that test is going to be either a, a feather in your cap or a strike against you. And I would rather see multiple tests that students, and, and you have this with our private school scholarship programs, those students are not required to take the state test. They can instead take other tests that reflect the, the curriculum that is offered there because there's a recognition that if you're sending a kid to a private school, you're presumably wanting something different and so it would be appropriate for the test to reflect that the school that you're attending perhaps gives greater emphasis to the liberal arts and classical education or 
perhaps gives greater emphasis to STEM programs and college readiness uh, for, uh, uh, and college and career readiness. Whatever the school is attempting to do ought to be the um, basis for whatever measurement is used, not some one-size-fits-all test that's used across the board. Well, so so that, that, I guess that's an interesting observation in terms of giving charters the flexibility. And I guess the question is, should all the schools um, have that flexibility? And then, and, and Joy, let me throw um, this one out. Maybe you can start with this question, which is, private schools are now receiving um, funding, taxpayer dollars through vouchers and other means, just like traditional public schools. Should we have a requirement that they meet all the standards, they take the same kind of assessments, that they get a letter grade for the schools as well? Um, that's, I think, something that's being debated now. Um, is it, should we have that kind of situation where we've got a group of schools receiving taxpayer dollars, no requirements, no accountability, and then we have a whole another set that's under a whole different um, set of mandates? Well, I think at some point we're going to have to address that question. As you have more and more private schools dependent upon scholarship programs, be it the McKay Scholarship, the Gardner Scholarship, the Tax Credit Scholarship, now the Hope Scholarship, at what point does that private school become a public school to where they need to be even more transparent to the parents so that the parents know the choice they're making and the services that are going to be providing to their child, particularly if that child is ESC, because a lot of charter schools and private schools do not necessarily serve students with exceptionalities. So at what point do those private schools become public? And I don't know the answer to that because I am, I think if you're a private school, you're private. I mean, that's what parents send their their children to private schools for, for whatever reason, they're, they're paying money and they shouldn't have any state oversight, they're private schools. On the other hand, if you're taking, if over 50% of your students are on some type of scholarship, at what, at what point does the, uh, both the parents as well as, as the state have an obligation to the public to make sure that the tax avoidance funds are being accurately spent? And, and I really don't know the answer to that. Um, so I think as scholarships become more popular and are, are utilized and more money is going into those that would otherwise go into general revenue, I think those questions um, need to be answered. I think the, the, best, the best thing about public education is we are open to everyone. We take you, whoever you are, wherever you are, or whenever you come. That's our, that's our greatest gift to, I think, our country, and it's our greatest challenge. I think one of the things that competition has brought is providing more programs within a public school setting and these other settings. At what point do you change your accountability system, if you will, which has been one of the things that has brought increased NAEP scores and closed the achievement gap? Those are successes. We've been successful because we've had a strong accountability system. I don't want to lose some of that, but at the same time, I'm test weary, you know? And I think we all are. So how do you have an accountability system that can be comparable so that the assessments that these kids are taking, regardless of, what, of, of the impact it has on that school's perform, of that student's performance or the school's performance, even if it's just if it's diagnostic, how are we going to compare that if my kid goes to X charter school, Y private school with a scholarship, or C public school, traditional public school, is getting a good education? And I think that's the challenge of our next steps in accountability and in choice. I, I think we need to be more accountable to the taxpayer within the funds that we're providing within a multitude of delivery systems for, for families but we also need to be accountable to the taxpayer and to the parents who are making these choices. And that's kind of the next generation um, um, of issues that we need to address as a public school system. Um, I agree with you. I think if you're going to utilize my taxpaying dollars, there needs to be some accountability to how that's being used. Um, maybe it's not the same 
amount of the voucher that you're able to take with you, that travels with you, because the need, and I should hope that the dollar amount of that voucher is based on a formula for the need for the education of a child in Florida. And if that's the case, and a public school is exempt from some of that formula, then some of that voucher naturally should stay at the public school where it's needed. So I think we look at that, and I do think it's about rethinking accountability. We need accountability 2.0. So if it's, and right now it's what, 10.0? Accountability X, <laughs> but we need, if public schools have accountability and we are saying that it's not the same tests and the whole point of private schools and charter schools is to allow for flexibility in different styles of teaching, then have a different style of measuring to tell me that you're using our dollars appropriately. And, and Bill, if, if we have private schools that are now taking public dollars, should there be a requirement that they provide the same type of access as you would find if a parent showed up at the doorstep of a public school, it had public dollars going into a, a, another institution, should there be the same level of access and hence um, greater opportunities for uh, diversity uh, among the students there, um, ensuring that we're meeting students with special needs as well. What's your thinking on that? I always get um, kind of lost or confused when we start talking about public, private, because I'm not really sure sometimes what we're talking about exactly. Um, I mean, I understand that there are certain schools that we call public and other schools that we call private, and we have these dollars that we say are for the public schools, but some of those dollars come from the parents who send their kids to private schools. And those families are taxpayers too, they're citizens in good standing. They shouldn't be treated like redheaded stepchildren or second class citizens. And yet so often in our public conversation, they're kind of treated like pariahs. And I, I don't really get it because all anybody's trying to do here, I suspect, is to kind of do right by their kids. And what's funny to me is like, when I talk with parents in different population groups or different schools and whatnot, I mean, a lot of times I talk with the folks in the private schools and they lament the fact that their schools aren't more diverse. And they wish that the, the, there was greater socioeconomic and racial diversity at some of their schools. Um, and so I don't, I, in a perfect world, this is what I would, this is what I'd like to see happen, is that the per pupil dollars that are set aside for my child or your child are instead of sent to the district for the district to control and allocate, and to basically withhold if I choose something that the district doesn't want me to choose, a private school, let's say. Instead, those dollars would go to you and me. And we would take those dollars and we would take them to the local public school if that's where we wanted our child to attend, or we'd take them to the local private school, or we'd take them to the charter school, or we'd use them to buy online classes, or we'd do some combination of these different approaches. But we would control the dollars, and we would then make the choices based on that. And I seem to think that that would actually lead to better results across the board um, than the current system. Right. So, so the dollars um, follow the child. I think that's a, uh, I think that's a great perspective. Um, you know, as a economics major in, in, in college, one of the things that we always talked about in terms of rational decision making means that you know you almost have to have pretty good information and it seems to me that sometimes parents will probably spend more time trying to figure out what kind of television set to buy and do more research on that than figuring out what school they ought to actually put their child in so i mean i see that kind of disconnect in the uh, maybe it's an information gap in this whole free market piece. And w what are your thoughts? I uh, just throw that out at the panel. How do you close that information gap? So as we do create more of a, a free market, let's say we gave every parent the $7,300, $7,400, and they were going to take it to a traditional school, charter, or private. The money follows the kid. How do we create a system then where they're gonna have good information and make good choices versus maybe what the color of the building is or the sign on the front door. Carrie? 
How would you make that choice? So I'm thinking about online shopping. But, but seriously, you know, if you, if you want to comparison shop, there are a set of benchmarks and a place that you can go where you can find that information readily and compare your needs to what's in the market. There's no such place right now in public school. And well, so should the, should the state take that on as something that they could develop something like Absolutely. that? Absolutely, and, and I think it goes back to the other question that you had a little bit earlier, and I think something you mentioned in the way that um, how do we work together in the public school platform so that we're filling all the gaps. And I think it's all about looking again at the needs of the student and how are you serving that need so that you are presenting information in a way that parents can digest. And that's very hard to do when, mm -hmm. because it's complex information. But it should, there should be a marketplace of sorts where parents can digest that. I remember when, when Elle, my 13-year-old, was in the 10th, she was going into the seventh grade and they wanted her to make subject choices for the next grade. And I, I didn't know what the heck that paper meant. I was like, what does this mean? If you take this now, then what do you take tomorrow? And what do you take next semester? So I called a meeting. Can you please explain to me what I choose here and there? And what, if she takes this now, then what does she take next year? And what does she take the year after that? And what does this mean for graduation? And after an hour, I kind of got, well, it changes and there's a rule book. And I thought, okay, we should have a better way of communicating so that the choice, but you're right. If there's some kind of electronic platform, and I certainly think we can do it, mm -hmm. we just kind of need to get out of our own way. Yeah. Bill, what are your uh, thoughts on it? Uh, yeah, I, say something. I don't think the higher ed system that we have currently is perfect by any means, but I do think it's closer to where we would want to be with K through 12 than K through 12 is. And by that I mean, when it comes to college, no kid says, oh, well, I'd like to go to that school across the state, but I'm really supposed to go to the one closest to my home. That's the only, that's the choice for me. No, we routinely see kids go past the school that's closest to them to another school that they think is better for their particular needs. And it might be better because it's a big school and they want to go to a big school with a college football program or something. Or it may be a really small school where they can have smaller, more intimate uh, interactions with faculty members. So we have this mentality when it comes to higher ed that you have a wide array of options. You're not obligated to go to the school closest to your house. And there are various services that are available to help guide you in making those decisions. US News and World Report, Kiplinger, Wall Street Journal, any number of other ranking systems. And some of these ranking systems, in my view, as one who sent four off to college are vastly overrated and have criteria that I don't agree with or whatever. But I have, as a parent, the option of kind of choosing which of these considerations I really think are important and which ones really don't matter or shouldn't matter. And so I think that if you had parents who were empowered with the per pupil funds for their kid, you would, they would take the initiative to get information and sometimes they might call upon people who have specialized expertise. I mean, we have guidance counselors in schools currently. I could imagine a situation where you would have people who are education experts that might serve kind of like real estate agents do when you want to find a house. They kind of know the housing market and where, you know, what the consider the trade-offs are and what the considerations are for this house or that house. And you could go to someone who might be able to counsel you and say, given your priorities and your kids' needs and interests, these are the options that you ought to consider and here's how you would go about getting in, um, enrolled in those different uh, classes. So th that's the direction that I'd like to see us head. And, and higher ed does offer us, I think, some hope that this sort of system could be created and would naturally kind of arise up. No one told US News to go and start this ranking service, but boy, they've made a killing off of it. <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the last uh, question, I think we're gonna run into um, questions uh, from the audience after this. No, you, no, 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 I have to. Have you to got it, you got it, go <laughs> ahead, all right. She's not, go ahead, let it, let it go. Go, okay. Jay. First of all, 
um, my kids were in public school, and around March of every year, I got a plethora of envelopes in my mailbox and on email telling me the choices that my child could have within the Leon County public school system. And I had the choice to send my child to any high school or middle school that I wanted to send him to if I signed up at the, at the time slot they wanted me to sign up. You know, in some ways it was overwhelming. Yes, I kind of would like to have had an agent, and I'm, a, I'm an educated parent. So there are pu public schools, school districts, I think, do a much better job now of letting parents know of the choices within the, the district. But in fact, we have to provide them information about charter schools and other, ch other choice options that are not within the public school setting. So we, have to, we, we provide that information. It is available. And it's, it's, we are, I mean, the good thing about public education, it is something that is um, constitutional. We, we require to provide free without fees. So we're not limited to the college when you got to worry about, do, I, do my parents have the money to send me to this college that I really would like to go to, like Florida State? Okay, just let me make real sure that that's the Ivy League college and university you want to go to is Florida State. Just, just, just making that point. The other thing with the, with, absolutely. The other thing, and I'll be a little radical here, is okay, if you're going to give every parent um, a certain amount of money to choose which school they want to go to, and we're going to have free market, then let's have it be free market. So if I'm a public school, if I'm Leon High School, your entitlement is to the voucher. It's not to which school you get to go to. So if I'm the principal of Leon High School, and I really don't want you in my school because I've seen that you're a behavior problem, and you don't really, are you really not a good football player, or you're not, you're not really good in school, you're not a, you don't make good grades, hmm, not gonna come to my public school now. That vouch, the entitlement is the voucher. It's not, to the school. Mm -hmm. So what happens to public education? You know, I, the, again, the, the greatest thing about public education and public schools is we take you wherever you are and whoever you are. And that's our greatest challenge. So to me, that's going to be the real tension between in a free market idea of, of choice and voucher versus, uh, versus, I think, our society's obligation to ensure that all children get a high quality education mm -hmm. and and that I think that's some of the tension you get um, you know between and among those who are are within the public school system advocating for for a variety of choice and um, and a free market system Good. and how, how well, do you solve those that tension well joy I'm glad we let you go last I think that was <laughs> yeah. a great great <laughs> wrap up um, <laughs> I uh, certainly want to thank the, thank the panel, and I think we open it up for questions now, so looking forward to it. So give them a hand, please. Thank you.